What is the difference between a minister and a state minister? Andhra Kumara questions in parliament. Cabinet Tamatu, Satipata Cabinet Tegrenoa, Raja Maturia, Tamanga Patrika, Kutra Tino Cabinet Tegreno. Muka the minister. MP Gavindu opposes the distribution of pens and books through an American aid program at the workshop for novice MPs. Me parliament tour, Mirate, Uttaritira Etenea, Videsha Mudalverti Atar, Nui, Totagane Ayupuba, Apage Adasai. Ordinary level examination to be conducted from the 18th to the 27th of January. Presidential Commission questions AG on legal barriers to reinstate Lalit Chaya Singha, who was charged for protecting Swiss Kumar. Will an electrical superintendent be made a scapegoat for the island wide blackout? Come at the to travel from door to door again to meet the public, commencing tomorrow. Good evening, you are watching Primetime News and in your Leeds story tonight. What is the difference between a cabinet minister and a state minister? Jatik Dhanabalaveke MP Anruk Maritsa and Ayaka raised this question in parliament today. What is the difference between a cabinet minister and a state minister? Every cabinet minister gets a secretary and every state minister gets a secretary. Separate funds are allocated for cabinet ministries. Separate funds are also allocated for state ministries. A state minister receives the same benefits of a cabinet minister. A cabinet minister attends cabinet meetings weekly. A state minister attends cabinet meetings when a cabinet paper on his subject is tabled. What is the difference? This is an attempt to use loopholes in the constitution. The separation between state and cabinet ministers were made to subvert the limit imposed on the number of ministers. Who is the minister in charge of defense in parliament? There is a state minister of defense. It is state minister Chamal Rajapaksa. But you are not in charge of the army. You only have the police and divisional secretaries. I would like to know if you are responsible for the 174 billion rupees by the state ministry of defense. It is the president who is acting against the constitution unchecked. This is the third time he is violating the constitution. That is why you cannot answer this. Requesting for 174 billion rupees from this parliament without the knowledge of the state minister of defense is not acceptable. Many ministries were separated and divided. We have a minister of environment who does not have under his ministry the institutions dealing with animals and forests. Is he a minister of environment? This is cabinet minister Mahinda Amaravira. C.B. Ratnayaka is the Minister of Wildlife. He has been assigned the State Timber Corporation. The Minister of Wildlife is tasked with cutting down trees. They say they are putting much effort to uplift local industries. How much have you allocated for local industries in the budget? You have only allocated 57 million rupees. The Supreme Court handed down a decision that the amendment of the value-added tax by then Finance Minister Ravi Kaurnanayaka was wrong. It was MP Bandula Gunawardhan who spearheaded the case against him. Do you remember? Now you have reduced VAT from 15% to 8%. Where is the approval of parliament? So you, who went to the Supreme Court to protect the right of this parliament to amend taxes, are now seated there. I believe MP Bandula Gunawardhan was standing on his feet last year, and this year, he's standing on his hands. <laughs> A number of parliamentarians informed the speaker today that their parliamentary privileges have been violated by two incidents that occurred during the workshop organized for novice MPs. A workshop for novice MPs was held at the parliamentary complex on the 25th and 26th of August. Parliamentarian Gevindu Kumaratunga raised the question on parliamentary privileges, alleging that his privileges were violated by the involvement of America in the two-day workshop organized for novice MPs. At the beginning of the workshop, we were given a copy of the Constitution and other documents on standing orders inside of a bag. This bag also contained a notebook and a pen with the official insignia of US aid. It was revealed that the Sri Lankan ambassador to America in 2017 got involved in getting cabinet approval for the new AXA agreement despite the observations made by the Navy and the Ministry of Defense. It was also revealed that he acted as the secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was appointed as the advisor of foreign affairs to the former speaker. When MP Chan Jayasumana raised the question as to whether these gifts violate the sovereignty of parliament, 
The General Secretary of Parliament said that USAID has been investing substantial sums of money for the improvement of the media division of Parliament. We are of the opinion that activities of this sovereign Parliament must be carried out without being suppressed by foreign funds. Also, we noticed at the workshop that the head of the NGO Transparency International, an institution that spreads various allegations against Sri Lanka, has been appointed as an official of the media division of Parliament by the previous Speaker. Mr. Speaker, are you aware of these gifts that have been given to us by an NGO that spreads various allegations about our country? I would like to inform you that I will not allow for the sovereignty of this parliament or any of its MPs to be compromised. The statement made by a parliamentary official that a parliamentarian's meal cost 3,000 rupees was also discussed in parliament today. The value of a parliamentarian's meal has become a huge issue, so please correct this information through the General Secretary of Parliament. About 2,000 employees of parliament, including drivers, eat here. We would like to know that if the entire figure given by the audit department was divided by 225, if that was done, it is an insult to all of us. They had initially added the value of food consumed by everyone and divided it by only 225. Later, when I inquired into this, I found out that it is only about 296 rupees that is spent on the meal of a single parliamentarian. There are countless instances where such news items were reported on newspapers without proper clarification. I propose some action to be taken against the officials as well. These are serious mistakes. While members of parliament debate on the price of their meals, the problems of the farmers who feed the entire country are yet to be resolved. This is a report from the Damsopura and Thambitagama villages in the Kurunagala district. The farming community is nourished by the waters of the left bank of the Rajangane Reservoir. These farming communities commenced paddy cultivation almost 30 years ago when the supply of water was at much higher levels which enabled them to produce several export crops including chilies. However, they are now facing a severe water crisis due to Usan irrigation system not being renovated for several years. These farmers are compelled to use tractors to bring in water to nourish their paddy fields. Shouldn't attention also be drawn to the problems of the general public, similar to the manner in which the price of a meal is debated in Parliament? The fifth edition of the Gum at the Door to Door Initiative, together with, together with the University of Peradeniya, will commence tomorrow. The fifth edition of the Gum at the Door to Door Initiative, together with the University of Peradeniya, will commence tomorrow. Before the commencement of the program, delegations from Gum and the University of Peradeniya called on the Mahanayakas today to obtain their blessings. The heads of Gum and a delegation from the University of Peradeniya, led by Vice Chancellor Professor Upul B. Desanayaka and Professor Tilak Bandara, first called on the Mahanayaka of the Malvatu chapter, the most venerable Tibbatuave, Sri Sumangalatera. Thereafter, the delegation called on the Mahanayaka of the Askiri chapter, the most venerable Barakagoda, Sri Nyanaratanatera. The Siddhasa Media Network had carried out a great deal of work for the betterment of the people. We have understood it as a network which remains with the people during both good times and bad. We invoke blessings on the Siddhasa Media Network for success in this endeavour. The Gamma at the Door to Door program will be a great relief to the people. The Gamma at the Door to Door initiative was born in 2016 and has been in operation across Sri Lanka ever since. Gamadha has visited more than 30,000 villagers in Sri Lanka, spoke to the people in those villages, documented their issues and released four comprehensive reports on its findings. Since 2016, these reports mainly highlight the lack of access to clean drinking water and the human elephant conflict 
as the main issues that impact the lives of rural Sri Lanka. Based on the findings and the documented reports, the gum and the community upliftment projects were born across the country. For these projects to be realized, the data collected via the gum at the door-to-door -door initiative have proven to be of paramount importance. The fifth edition of the gum at the door-to-door -door initiative, which will begin tomorrow, will cover all 25 districts of Sri Lanka. The vote on account for the four months ending on the 31st of December 2020 was passed without a division in Parliament today. Here are some of the views expressed during the debate. The issue that we see here is the questions on the legality of the funds that were spent from the 1st of April to the 1st of September because we have an issue on how money was spent during this period without parliamentary approval. So I am of the stance that without making this a bad precedent, we should all unite and solve this legal issue. We came to the House in the month of February to prevent an economic crisis from taking root in the country due to delays in making these payments. Because of the wrong decision taken by the opposition not to approve it, there was an attempt on one hand to willingly create a crisis in the country. After the parliament was dissolved, there was a lockdown in the country. During this time, even the Elections Commission requested for a large sum of money to conduct the elections. At a time when we should have been united and worked together, they worked towards defeating the government and bringing about an economic crisis. Because of that, they faced a massive defeat. <laughs> There were lockdowns all over the world, but that does not give anyone the right to place the constitution under lockdown. It has clearly been stated that parliament is fully responsible for state funds. This cannot be dismissed. We would like to know under which law did you allocate funds from the 30th of April to the 31st of August. Honorable Minister Dinesh Gunawardhana knows about this. That is why he is acting like this. <laughs> Please remember that the consequences of you violating the constitution will run you down. The government plans on presenting the budget in the month of November. The aim of both the vote on account and the budget will be the development of the national economy. That is the goal. The way in which we are planning on reaching this goal is included in the vote on account and the budget that we are going to present. What is reality now? When 50,000 jobs are being given, 400,000 jobs have been lost. The tourism sector, the service sector and the construction sector have collapsed completely. Factories have stalled. Has the government included a stimulus package in this water account? How many people have been given this concessionary loan at 4% interest? This is the package given by India. This is the package by Pakistan. This package is given by Bangladesh and this is given by Germany. Looking at all of these, it is almost as if there was no stimulus package given in Sri Lanka. What has happened to stents? They have stopped issuing stents. Intracular lenses were given before. That has been stopped as well. Money is being spent on bypass surgeries that were conducted for free. Also, where is the 3,000 rupee bag of food that was promised to the people of this country? People are not happy about the statement made by MP Vigneshwaran. Do not make statements that will create racial issues in the country. We do not want another war in the country. We are also not hoping to treat any race specially or undermine another race. When we get elected to parliament, we make a pledge. That shouldn't be restricted to words. The fourth sub-article pledges to safeguard the constitution. The seventh sub-article pledges to act against acts that are carried out to divide the country. We shouldn't just talk about it. 
I believe we should stand by this in and out. We consider instigating racism in parliament as a disrespect towards parliament. I'd like to remind him that we will not bow down to anyone to underestimate the Sinhalese. Honourable Speaker, let a commission be appointed consisting of top Sinhala, Tamil, Muslim and international historians well versed in South Asian history to report on our heritage and, hus and history. The historians must be internationally recognised persons. I for my part would like to tender a note to your honour to, to be included in the Hansard which speaks of the antiquity of the Tamil language and the Tamil society in Sri Lanka prepared by a respected emeritus professor of history, Professor Patmanadhan. To my friend Mr. Udaya Gaman Pillai, I like to tell him that during the past 10 or 15 years, all his historical references have become outdated. Let him learn his history again and then come back. An honourable member from Colombo named me personally yesterday and referred to certain matters against me. Finally, he, firstly he said that I had forbidden Sinhalese and Muslims entering north when I was chief minister. Truly I must be a demon to have said so when my children have both married Sinhalese. Meanwhile, a dispute has arisen due to the appointment made to the Parliamentary Select Committee. This was due to MP Ali Sabri of the opposition being appointed to the committee instead of Minister Ali Sabri of the ruling party. The matter was subject to discussion during today's parliamentary session. The appointments made to the parliamentary select committee yesterday included the names of MP Ali Sabri. I believe this is the name of our opposition MP from the Putlam district. Can you please explain this? When letter of appointment is said, you must be cautious. You cannot change it. I disagree. Such mistakes cannot take place just because it's the first time. If I hand over a letter of appointment to you, can I take it back? No. Meanwhile, the opposition member who was appointed to the parliamentary select committee by mistake said this evening that he would step down from his appointment. The appointment was made without my consent. I was elected to parliament to serve the people. However, this appointment will not contribute to serving the public. It is just a title. Therefore, I decided to step down from this position. MP Kumara Velgamar said that the then members of the opposition agreed to the 19th Amendment to the Constitution upon instructions of Mahinda Rajapaksa. The ruling party has a two-thirds majority and has the power to bring in a new constitution to suit the needs of Sri Lankans. However, dual citizenship, in my view, is not something that falls under this suitability criteria. In my view, if one has dual citizenship, it also means that the person can engage in any corrupt activity and flee the country. Therefore, I do not agree with dual citizenship. When the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was presented in Parliament, all MPs except for one raised their hands in favour of the amendment. Even I raised my hand. Mahinda Rajapaksa, who was the then leader of the opposition, advised us to vote in favour of the amendment. So we all raised our hands. You must ask that from the Rajapaksa family. I see the new constitution as a family controlled one. If we repeal the constitution piece by piece, we will have to face the same situation that Rani Vikramasinghe and Maitri Palasiri Sena had to face when bringing in the 19th Amendment to the constitution. Their objective was to transfer all the executive powers of the president to the prime minister. However, due to the intervention of the Supreme Court, the executive powers were distributed to three areas. <laughs> Are the Panasate, Abimahindamata, Agamatika will be the car, 
In simpler terms, if the executive powers were a blazer suit, the president was given the trouser, the prime minister was given the shirt and the speaker was given the tie. The executive powers were distributed to three areas and the entire country lost. In my views, the positives of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution should remain, while the negatives should be removed. So technically, it is best if we repeal the 19th Amendment and incorporate the positive aspects of the 19th Amendment in a new Constitution. <laughs> One hundred and thirteen is more than enough for us, but the people gave one hundred and fifty. With a two-thirds majority in parliament to amend the constitution or to introduce a new constitution, we will do that immediately. <laughs> Welcome back. According to the interim report of the committee appointed to probe the nationwide power interruption on the 17th of August 2020, the key reason for the power disruption was due to the incorrect operation by the electrical superintendent in charge at the Keravalipike grid substation present at the time. It also added there is no robust maintenance protocol in place at the Keravalipike grid substation. The report of the nine-member committee was made public at the media briefing today and notably the Director General of the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka, Dammitu Kumara Singha, who is a member of the committee, had not signed the report. The Keravalapitya grid substation tripping was caused because correct maintenance procedures were not followed by the electrical superintendent and it caused a tripping at the Lakvijaya power station in Norochole. As a result, the entire country experienced a power failure. The interim report also found the CEB's failure to avoid a countrywide blackout and taking a long time to restore power indicates significant lapses in the implementation of critical measures outlined by previous committees. Research done by the Manitibo Research Center in 2016 had made several recommendations to prevent such a blackout from taking place. There was a five-member committee appointed in February. The report of the committee clearly mentioned how information systems should be used. However, none of these recommendations have been implemented to date. There are steps that should be taken in order to eliminate mistakes taking place in high-risk areas. There are certain maintenance procedures at the CEB. However, in this context, it is clear that the procedure has not been followed. There were no checklists in place. During the media briefing, it was revealed that the committee had not found anyone directly responsible for the power outage. This report focuses more on the reason for the failure and the steps that should be taken to prevent such a failure from taking place in the future, rather than the factions being responsible for it. The committee was vested with the responsibility to provide recommendations to prevent such a crisis from taking place in the future and this is what we have presented in the form of an interim report. Protection scheme We have not confirmed as of yet whether there is a problem with the protection scheme. We will do a detailed study and see if we can further improve this protection scheme. However, we can confirm that the maintenance protocols were not implemented. The superintendent is not the only one responsible for this. All those who are responsible for implementing the maintenance protocol should be held accountable. Even senior officials, including the general manager, is responsible for this. On the commemoration of the World Poppy Day, the first poppy flower was presented to President Gota Biraj Paksa at the Presidential Secretariat this morning. Major General Upul Pereira, President of the Sri Lanka Veterans Association, presented the first poppy flower to the President. In commemoration of the war heroes who laid down their lives in the world wars, 
The Veterans Association of Sri Lanka has been marking Poppy Flower Day every year since 1944. The Sri Lanka Veterans Association also donated 1 million rupees to the COVID-19 fund. The Minister of Education said the 2020 GCE Ordinary Level Examination will take place from the 18th to the 27th of January 2021. Issuing a communicate, the Ministry of Education said all schools will be closed during the set period of the exam. According to the Ministry, the period from 1st to 18th of January 2021 will be a study leave only for students sitting for the GCE O-Level examination. The third term school holidays for 2020 will be from 24th December to 1st January and first term for 2021 will begin on the 4th of January. The Education Ministry further noted that following the conclusion of the O-Level examination, schools will reopen on the 1st of February. The great Grade 5 scholarship examination will take place on Sunday, the 11th of October. The advanced level examination will take place from 12th October to 6th November. Schools will be on holiday from the 10th of October to the 8th of November. There is no issue in reinstating interdicted senior DIG Lalit Anurudh Jayasinghe, said the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing into incidents of political victimization. The PCUI said the Attorney General will be informed of its position on the matter on Monday. Senior DIG Lalit Jaisinghe was arrested, remanded and then granted bail after he was charged with harboring and assisting Mahalingam Sivakumar, alias Swiss Kumar, the main suspect of the Vidya Sivaloganathan rape and murder case. To flee, he was later indicted. In a complaint filed with the Presidential Commission of Inquiry, the interdicted senior DIG said the charges filed against him were politically motivated. Interdicted senior DIG Lalit Anuruddha Jayasinghe, appearing at the Presidential Commission, requested for an interim order to be made on the National Police Commission to reinstate him in service. Counsel Mahesh Kotovella, appearing for the senior DIG, said his client only has another 11 months to complete his service. Chairman of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry, retired Supreme Court Judge Upali Abhiratna said the position of the Presidential Commission would be made known on the 31st of August. Additional Solicitor General Rohanta Abe Surya said the matter would be looked into when asked on the position of the Attorney General. The Chairman of the Commission questioned on what obstructions are in place to reinstate Anuruddha Jayasinghe in service if it was possible to reinstate IP Neomar Rangajiva who is charged with the massacre at the Valikada prison. Deputy Inspector General of Police Ajit Rohana was issued with summons to appear at the Presidential Commission on the 31st of August. This is with regard to facts presented to the Commission on an earlier occasion by SP KKK Gunasekara from the police unit of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing into incidents of political victimization. SP KKK Gunasekara provided evidence to the Presidential Commission with regard to the allegations made against Lalit Anuruddha Jaisinghe for his conduct on a homicide based on political interference. Five quintuplets were born at the Dizoisa Women's Hospital in Colombo this morning. All five infants were girls. According to doctors, the mother and the five babies are all in good health. We had a quintuplet birth in our hospital by a caesarean surgery today. We got all the required equipment from the health ministry prior to the operation. We think this is the first time in history where all five infants born are girls. It's really hard to carry five babies in the womb. But this mother faced it with a lot of courage. She was in the hospital for the past four weeks. We don't have many facilities here, so we waited till we got five nursery beds in the neonatal unit. After that, we planned to conduct the surgery today. There was a doctor for each baby in the neonatal unit. We had a lot of bleeding from the mother, as expected. We were ready for that. For now, we can say that the mother is in a stable condition. However, she is still under supervision at the intensive care unit. That is at Karekake, Balagan, Not. Time News Fortnight. Have a great and safe Friday night.